The Holy Spirit is in this house right now. I ask that you would just open up your hearts and your minds and your souls and let that flow in and not be afraid of that. Jeff, now I'm going to introduce you. I've known this guy for quite a while. When we went to Zion Church, that's the first time I ever seen Jeff Burkett in my life. He said I was the first one that greeted him at the door. I don't remember that, but he remembered that. And so, uh, Carrie, his wife, and his children, we just love you so much. Connie and I, they're, they're really dear friends to Connie and I. We love them so much. Uh, district attorney in Jefferson County, I hope you don't mind I say that. And uh, I will say this, I went up one time when he did a trial and I said to Connie, remind me not to ever do anything wrong and I have to win that court because I, I don't want to have to come under that. But anyway, with all that being said, I want to introduce my dear friend, Jeff Burkett. This is my first trip into this magnificent new building you have here. And I'm now looking from a viewpoint I've never looked from before. You all look good. It's good to be here. But I have to tell you, when you have the pulpit, you feel the gravity of it. See, I feel the gravity standing here right now. When God asks you to speak and preach His Word, it's a heavy burden. So I pray that you would pray for me today as I do that. And I pray that you would pray for everyone who stands up to take this awesome responsibility, because it is. When you're behind this pulpit, you are God's spokesman. And I pray that God's Spirit will move mightily today. That's what I'm, pr I'm praying for, nothing less than God's Spirit to move in a major way in hearts and minds. Now, Craig Shepner came up to me and he said, so how bad are you going to beat us up today? I said, I'm actually not. Today is meant to be a message of encouragement, tremendous encouragement, because in my two messages, I'm going to fit this into two messages. I'm going to be speaking this week and in two weeks from now. I'm going to be talking about the topic of tapping into the power of God tapping into His power for the purpose of living godly, victorious, productive, fruitful lives to the glory of God. Do you know how much Scripture has to say about the incredible power that is available to us who believe in Jesus Christ? Do you know how much it says? It's outrageous. And you're going to find out that God wants us to live in that power. He doesn't want us to just know about it. He wants it to make that 18-inch trip from here in our heads to here in our hearts. And He wants us to live in that truth. Scripture, this is the one part I'll step on your toes. Okay, this is it. Now, Scripture sets the bar very high for a believer. Okay? Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever read portions of Scripture about what's expected of us, and you say, seriously, God, do you know me? Do you know, do you know Jeff, how flawed and imperfect I am? See, we read passages in the Bible that make these impossible demands of us. We read things like this, be holy as I am holy. We read that we must walk as Jesus walked. Seriously? We read that we are to be imitators of God. We read, and here's a, here's a good one, we read that we're to love our enemies. Seriously? Really? Do you know some of my enemies, God? Come on. But here's the truth in it. The truth of the gospel is that God does not just issue these commands without giving us the power to fulfill them. He promises it. So it's my prayer that you would leave here today encouraged by God's Word regarding what is possible in your life by living in the power of God. Now, who is this message for? Well, it's for everyone. We all need God's power to live right before Him. 
The world right now, do you believe this? The world right now needs to see a church that displays the power of God. It needs it. Desperately, turn on your TV set. But I really pray that this message will make a difference for people who right now desperately need hope. Anybody like that right now? Anybody need hope? See, I was driven to the scripture I'm going to preach on because I need hope. I look around and I'm discouraged by a lot of things I see. I'm down. And I need hope. And I need encouragement. Do you feel beaten down? Do you feel tired? Do you feel disillusioned? Things aren't working out the way you saw it in your head. Does this world have you down? Maybe you're living with regret. Maybe you think you've made some bad mistakes and they've determined the rest of the course of your life. Maybe you feel like you've lost a lot of time. Maybe you're trying to change, but you're feeling like you can't. You know you're not living in God's best for you, but you've just resigned yourself to it and say, well, this is just the way it's going to be. Meager expectations. Maybe you're losing the personal battle against sin in your own life. Today, we're going to look at the face of the God of exceedingly, abundantly. And he has power for living that is available to you. He is the God that turns mourning into joy. You saw the songs. You read the words. You sang the words. He's the God that turns mourning into joy. He is the God who brings beauty from ashes. And there is always hope when we know him. So I'm going to introduce you today to what I believe to be one of the grandest prayers that is recorded in all of Scripture. It was prayed by the Apostle Paul for the church at Ephesus. And let me tell you a couple things that I believe fully. If it's a prayer that is recorded in Scripture, you know that it is a prayer that God delights in. You know that it's a prayer that God wants His children to pray. And you also know that it is a prayer that God wants to answer in your life. A lot of our prayers, we don't know how God wants to answer them. But when we pray the prayers of Scripture, we can know we're in God's will. You see, Paul, the apostle who wrote this incredible letter, he desperately needed the power of God. He desperately needed it. I think that is why the apostle talked so much about the power of God. See, he was the missionary that I believe was the most responsible for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in all of human history. But Paul paid a tremendous personal cost for his devotion to the Lord Jesus. We're not going to read it today, but it, later, check out 2 Corinthians 11 and look at everything Paul went through for the gospel. Paul talked about constantly being imprisoned. Paul wrote this incredible prayer in this letter from prison. He talked about countless beatings, many times when he was brought nearly to death. Five times he received the 40 lashes, less one. Countless beatings with rods. He was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He was in danger all the time. Danger from rivers, robbers, his own people, the Gentiles. He was danger in the city. He was in danger in the wilderness. And here's one that had to hurt really bad. He was in constant danger from false brothers. So Paul knew betrayal. You want to talk about hurt that hurts deep, betrayal. Paul knew it. But with all that adversity, how did Paul find the strength to go on, to live hard for Christ, to not let it deter him in his mission? You see, Paul was a very strong man on the inside. He had incredible internal strength. And we get insight from how he dealt with this from 2 Corinthians 
chapter 4. First scripture to go up on the screen, gentlemen. Paul writes this, but we have this treasure, okay, and you're going to see he's talking about God's power, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Jars of clay was a common expression used in that time for human weakness, human weakness. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We are struck down, oh, but we're not destroyed. So you know what Paul was saying there. He said, we're nothing to look at. We're just normal human containers We're nothing special to look at, nothing special on the outside, but we have a surpassing power from God living in us that allows us to deal with awful circumstances, terrible adversity, hard times in a supernatural way, a way that brings God the glory, not us. Amen? So a few more verses down in that same chapter, he says this. He says, so we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Amen? Paul's strength came from a strong inner man. Paul's grit, his determination to get through awful things, All that persecution, all that betrayal, terrible people, hardship, physical ailments, it all came from him being renewed in his inner man day after day after day after day by the power of God. That's how he did it. That's why he lived a life of purpose and power and how he changed the world through his ministry. And guess what? God's power still today gives strength for living in 2020. That same power that animated the Apostle Paul for ministry, that strengthened his inner being and empowered him to endure, to fight for the faith, to contend for Jesus, it's available to you and it's available to me. Do you got that? I don't know if you got that. Rod, it's available to you. Crystal, John, Jack, Gary, Sue, Jean, Connie. It's available to you today. It's not just some Bible story. But I'm here to tell you something. We cannot conjure this up in our own strength. We can't. It has to come outside of us. The power to live... God's way, we can't do it in our own strength. I don't know about you, but my willpower is quite limited. It will fail. No, we desperately need the power of God working in and through us, the God of exceedingly, abundantly. So with that in mind, how many of you already think you know where I'm going, by the way, in the Bible? Yeah, probably a lot of you. So with that in mind, will you now turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, so we can study this incredible prayer. By the way, Paul did not pray meager prayers. Paul shot for the moon in his prayers. Paul didn't pray those prayers. You know, you ever hear somebody go, and God, I pray you'll be with them. What's that even mean? Okay. No, Paul prayed prayers that will matter, that will make a difference. He shot high in his prayers, asking for big things. Starting in verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let that sit for a second. Now, I'm going to do something a little unorthodox here. I'm I'm going to unpack the end of this passage first. And then we're going to go backward and see how we get to verse 20. Okay, verse 20 says this. Now to him, that's God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen? I probably could leave right now, right? Maybe some of you want me to. But I'm telling you, that's powerful. Just the reading of it's powerful. Now, if Christians would actually believe this, okay, if we actually believed this and acted like it, oh, if we would live this way, what would happen? I've often heard verse 20 taken out of context and misused to simply convey the the thought that God can do anything. Now, that's true, but that's not what this passage is saying. It's saying something slightly different. See, what the Word is actually telling us is that because of the power that is at work within us, God is able to do absolutely amazing, incredible, unimaginable things in us and through us, and He will supply the power. Amen. Thank you, Gene. One theologian says that verse 20 is not hard to believe for a Christian until you add those last two little words at the end. It's easy for us to believe in God's great power until we try to think about the fact that that great power is working within us because we know ourselves too well. But yet that's what the Word's telling us. This passage is talking about God working and displaying His limitless power in His people, His beloved ones, His chosen ones, His church. He wants to display His glory and His power in and through your life. He loves you that much, and He wants to receive glory from your life. Now let's really examine what Paul is saying in verse 20. Verse 20. So think about this. Ready? I'm going to take you on a little ride here. God is able to do all that we ask. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good. Right? We can stop right there. That's pretty good. I I have a pretty extensive wish list on what I'd like to see God do in my life. Sometimes I get defeated and I just don't even ask anymore. I think, what's the bother? I am what I am. I'm not sure I can change. Does this passage give you permission to think that way? No. Strike those thoughts from your mind. But it gets better. See, God, it also says God is able to do all that we can think. And a lot of translations say imagine. I like that word. And that's pretty good too, isn't it? God can do all that you could even imagine in you. Let's take it another step. God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. More than that. And then it gets better than that. It says God is able to do far more than we can ask or imagine. And I really like the New King James Version of that verse, which says, and that's why I titled the sermon the way I did, it says God is able to do exceedingly more than what we can ask or imagine but it gets better yet. God is able to do abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. And then it gets better yet. 
It says God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. Another version of the Bible says it this way, and I like this too. It says God is able to do infinitely more than we would ever dare to even ask or imagine. People. Do you think you have big dreams for what can happen here at Cornerstone? Do you think that you have big dreams for what can happen in your life and what can happen here when people truly submit to and follow God? Do you think you have big dreams about what he's going to do in your life? How he can work in your life and through your life? Do you believe you have big dreams? Well, let me just shatter that illusion. I'm telling you right now that your dreams are puny, your dreams are meager, and your dreams are piddly compared to what God can do. That's what this passage, you can clap if you want to. I heard somebody wanted to. It just lets me know that you haven't checked out on me. I appreciate that. They're piddly. So doesn't that just make you want to praise God? Doesn't that just make you want to bring the worship team back up and start praising him? Is it any wonder then that Paul is so overcome with this truth that he just has to break out and praise Paul does that sometimes in his letters. He just starts praising God. And he says, oh, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. See, the God of exceedingly and abundantly is worthy of our praise. And I'm telling you that if we start to tap into this power, if we start to believe these truths, we will have no choice but to praise him with all of our life and all of our breath and all of our being. And it will change our worship. See, when God's power is flowing through you on a regular basis, when you're living godly, and it can't be credited to your human willpower, when you see the hand of God moving, you will have a heart full of praise for him. And this world needs to see a church that is constantly singing the praises of our great God. They need to see that more than they need to see your political viewpoint. They need it way more. They need to hear from us about the greatness of our God. Thank you. So then, this passage tells us we can live there. See, Paul, despite the fact that he wrote a huge portion of the New Testament, Paul was just a man. Paul was a flawed human being just like me and you. But he lived in the power of God. So now the obvious question that arises in your mind is, well, how do I tap into that? How do I appropriate that? Now, it would take me a couple months to fully unpack that. I've got two Sundays, so we're going we're, we're gonna to leave a few question marks in your mind. But we're going to go back a few verses, and we're going to start going up what some theologians have called a prayer staircase. See, in this prayer staircase, Paul starts asking for things, and every request just becomes more and more audacious, more and more unbelievable, until he gets to verse 20 and starts to praise God for his incredible power. And you'll see that in the next message, how crazy those prayer requests become. But the first step on this staircase is found in verse 16. Verse 16 of chapter 3. Paul prays this. He's praying for the Ephesian church. He says that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's Paul's first prayer request up the staircase. Now, Christians, the inner man, the inner being must be strong if we want to live a life that's pleasing to God. Because I'm telling you right now, everything that happens on the outside is already being determined by what's on the inside. Okay? 
on the inside. That's where the true battles are being waged. On the inside, that's where the war is being won or lost. The inner being determines the entire trajectory of your life. What is going on there determines all that you do, all that you aspire to, all that you decide, all your convictions, your attitudes. It determines ultimately what the outside world sees and what the outside world hears. Remember when Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But it all starts inside. Think about the Olympic athlete. You ever watch those gymnasts do things that seem to be absolutely impossible? They have such incredible power in their bodies to make them go up onto those balance beams and land and do all these moves. But before those gymnasts are incredibly strong in the outside, they have to be very strong on the inside. See, you know the stories. You've read about some of those people. They have gotten up for years at 3 o'clock in the morning to get their gym time in. They have sacrificed. They have pushed their bodies to the absolute limit. And the internal grit and fortitude that they have to show to just get up and push their bodies to the limit every day when their beds are crying out to them and their friends are asleep. See, they're strong on the inside before they can ever be strong on the outside. Do we need a strong inner being today? Yeah. Yeah, the world's calling out for people who can be strong and steady in the midst of the storms of this life. Well, why do we need inner strength? Well, it's an endless list. It's an endless list. Think about it. We need strength to deal with the unfairness of this life. Life throws a lot of garbage at us. We live in a fallen world. We need strength to deal with difficult people. Do you have any of those in your life? Difficult people in a godly way. We need strength, inner strength to deal with health problems, death, constant physical pain for some people, family problems, relationship problems, parenting, anxiety, worry, stress. Have any of you felt any of that in the last four months? We've got a very uncertain future, right? And because of that, uncertain future on this earth, okay? Not uncertain ultimately, but uncertain now. And that can cause a lot of anxiety, which God's Word says is not the option for the Christian. We need inner strength to stand for Christ and for truth in this culture, which, by the way, have you noticed, is rejecting biblical truth. It's rejecting it. We need inner strength to make the right moral choices and do the right thing, even if it comes at a tremendous personal cost. And here's one that I think is coming big time. We need inner strength to deal with persecution because it's coming. We have seen the start. We have seen the dominoes start to fall. We've enjoyed over 200 years of freedom and blessing in many ways. But you can see how the world is beginning to marginalize the church. So we need inner strength to deal with persecution in a godly way. We need inner strength to be people who are not tossed to and fro by our emotions, by circumstances, by people. The watching world needs to see us handle hard things, awful things, with dignity, with grace, and love. And that's hard to do sometimes. I don't always feel real loving these days. They need to see a church that's steadfast in our convictions. We will never. I hate it when I see a supposedly Christian pastor go on TV and then minimize biblical truth just so they can fit in with whatever talk show they're on. We need His strength to do this. See, God in His infinite wisdom and sovereignty, He allows us to go through hard times. He does, for good. He doesn't promise an easy life in this world. 
And he wants us to stop trusting in the things of this world. I hope that you're not putting your faith in people. I hope you're not putting it in leaders, in institutions, in routines and practices, because you're seeing right now on the world stage those things being swept away. No, God wants us to put our hope in Him, in Him alone. But let me tell you one of the most important reasons why we need inner strength. We need inner strength to battle sin, to live lives that are pleasing to Him in every way, that honor and glorify Him. Why do we need such strength? You know, I've had the question asked to me, <clears throat> why once we become a Christian, once the Bible says that we become a new creation in Christ, the Bible says that now God's Holy Spirit comes to live in us, why do I still have such awful thoughts? Why do I still have inclinations towards sin? Well, let me explain that to you. Very quick theological lesson for you in a couple minutes. You see, a war begins the moment you bow your knee to Jesus. A war begins. And that war is real. I feel it every day. Galatians 5 describes it like this. It says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. You may ask, but why? What's, why am I not seeing more change? Well, that's because, in one theologian's words, when you become a Christian, you are now a new, redeemed, holy creation that is incarcerated in unredeemed flesh. You've still got f- sinful flesh on your bones. So when the Scripture talks about the spirit versus the flesh, it's talking about the fact that you now have a new nature. You you are a new creation, and that new creation loves God and desires to please Him. And by the way, if you don't even have those desires, better check your salvation. The Bible says, though, that you now have a new nature that wants to please God. You now have the ability to say no to sin that you did not have before. You you couldn't say no to sin before. But you've also got this flesh, this body, this mind that has inclinations. It has passions. It has appetites for sin that didn't go away now that you belong to Christ. And once you become a Christian, the war between those factions has now begun. There was no battle before. You did what you pleased. Whatever felt good, you did. But now you have a king that you want to please. In Romans, Paul describes the war this way. He says in chapter 7, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. See, that war is why our actions confound us at times. Have you ever, have you ever said to yourself, what was I thinking? Did, why did I say that? Oh, how did I handle that so badly? Well, you're in good company because the Apostle Paul felt the same way at times. A few verses back in Romans 7, he says this, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want. Yeah, that's what I keep on doing. Can you relate to this? We need to be strong. See, Christians should be marked by a grit and determination and mental toughness that makes us live lives for His glory. But those things can't come from within. We need a power supply. And what is the power supply that is listed in our first verse that we're looking hard at? The The power supply is the what? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power supply. It says that Paul's prayer is that they would be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. See, God's Word is replete 
with promises of power that is available to us. What was one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended from the earth? He looked at them, and you know what they had to be thinking is, how are we going to deal with life without Jesus? We've had Jesus for three years, and now he's just going to leave. What are we going to do? Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 2 Timothy chapter 1 says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And this is why we are told in the scriptures to walk in the spirit, to be filled with the spirit. Different sermon, different time. But we are promised power. Now, the word that we translate power, this is kind of cool. In the Greek, it is the word dunamis. Dunamis. It is used 120 times in the New Testament to convey the thought of miraculous power, might, and strength that comes from God. It is the word from which we get our word, Dynamite, dynamite, dynamite. The implication is that we as believers in Jesus Christ have spiritual dynamite at our disposal. See, and God's not subtle in his word about wanting us to know this power and know that it's available to us. He says this in Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Amen. That's exceedingly abundantly power, right? Ephesians 1, Paul's desperate for people to understand this. He wants the eyes of their hearts. He says, the eyes of your hearts to be enlightened, that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. We are talking about resurrection power. Resurrection power. No one can raise people from the dead. God can. And that's the power that is available to us. This is the power that Paul tapped into. Colossians 1 verse 29, I think, gives us great insight about the synergy, the partnership that took place between Paul and God in tapping into this power. He says in that verse, and listen to the pronouns, okay? The pronouns are what's important here, okay? For this I toil, Paul, okay, that's I. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. See, that's the synergy. Now, the Greek word for toil, okay, Paul's saying I work hard, I toil. It means working to the point of total exhaustion. And Paul says I toil, struggling, Struggling is, comes from the Greek word agonizomai, from which we get the word agonize. And it was used to describe the effort given when competing in an athletic event and giving your absolute, complete all. But Paul knew that as hard as he worked, it was all going to be meaningless if it wasn't for God's energy working powerfully within him. And the word powerfully is the Greek word dynamē, which sounds a lot like dynamite. And that's how Paul lived. He gave his everything, he gave his complete effort, he expended himself while knowing that the power came from God. Do you live your life believing, because that's a big part of this equation, Do you live your life believing you have spiritual dynamite living within you? I need to believe it a lot more. 
And God loves to give this power. Paul's prayer is that God would give this power according to the riches of his glory. That's the phrase he uses. God has an endless, infinite supply of power to give us constantly, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, in every situation. And maybe that's part of the key to tapping into this. We need to know this and ask for it constantly. Do you pray for that kind of power when you're dealing with difficult situations, when you feel weak, when you feel like you can't go on? Are you tapping in by constantly asking God for him to grant you this? Now, what's one way that we can know if God's Holy Spirit is working powerfully within us? This is just one test. Do you ever hear the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, that is the Spirit-filled life. That's the Spirit-filled life. This is a life that is animated by the power of God. And is that what our lives are looking like? And if we want to, if we want them to, we need God's power. Verse 25 says that we should keep in step with the Spirit. And the Greek word means to walk in line behind a leader. So is the Holy Spirit leading you? Is that your leader? Is he guiding you? Or are you trying to do it on your own? You're trying to walk in the flesh. Now, my time is about done. And we have only taken one step up the staircase. We're going to be running up the staircase the next time. It's going to feel like drinking from a fire hose, I'm quite sure. But I want to tell you this. I'm sure that many of us in this room are not living in God's exceedingly abundantly power. Truth be told, I struggle with it. I'm immersing myself in this scripture because I'm waiting for it to make the full trip down. But I do believe that God can do amazing things as he molds me, as he shapes me, as he changes me, and as I submit to him and I learn to love him more and as I immerse myself in his word. And I'm going to ask you to do something today. I'm going to ask you to commit that you will pray just like the Apostle Paul prayed. That according to the riches of God's glory, that he would grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And while you're praying, pray the same thing for your brothers and your sisters here at Cornerstone. Pray for strength and power in the inner being for all that you have ahead of you. Now, let me give one caveat to this. If you are here today, and if you have never bowed your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know something about this message. This power that I have described, it's not available to you. You're on your own. If you never ask for forgiveness for your sins and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can't know this power, but you can. And I would call upon you today. Would today be the day that you come to know him, that you come to know the God of exceedingly, abundantly. And believers, I pray that you would come to know more the God of exceedingly, abundantly. Stop thinking, I can't change. God's done with me. Oh, I'm defeated. I'm discouraged. I'm this, I'm that. No, take your eyes off of yourself, stop looking in the mirror, and start looking to the God of exceedingly and abundantly. Amen? Amen. Worship team, will you come forward? Maybe they left. Maybe you're, hi. (laughs) DAs don't like it when people sneak up on them, but... The altars are open, so I would call upon you, come and do business with God today and start the journey 
of tapping into the power of the God of exceedingly abundantly.